Welcome, family of God. It's Pastor Detina Heard and Meditating Life Center Ministries in Louisville, Kentucky, with our Sunday service for Sunday, March 17th, 2024. Hey, hello, everyone. I'm glad that you're here. I know you're saying she has on green because it's St. Patrick's Day, but that's not true because guess what? St. Patrick wore sky blue. Right? So we need to make sure that we know what we're celebrating, right? Because definitely when St. Patrick first came about, he wasn't even Irish, was he, y'all? Wasn't he from Britain? Right? And then he got kidnapped or something. The story is so many different ways. And he got saved. He was like he got saved when he was a, a slave or a prisoner or something. And so he uh, began missionary work later. And, um, and in Ireland, when they originally celebrated St. Patrick, not only did they have sky blue as the color, but they also had it as religious services, honoring the work that he did to get people saved, right? But guess what happened? They brought it to America, right? Y'all know you Irish people probably know, and some of you adopted Irish people who's been partying. You know, Americans love to party. And so they made it like a, Celebration of all things Irish and I guess adopted Irish and anybody who wants to have a good time and they changed the colors to green like the shamrock and then they said, well, we can make money off of this. We can get more tourists to come in. And so they started having this big celebration that had nothing to do with God necessarily. I'm sure some of you all maybe still do that. Hopefully you say, hey, people got saved by St. Patrick according to the legend. Um, and... Uh, the rest of y'all go like, hey, Irish, and for us, Irish means wearing green and having parties and parades and drinking, hopefully not to excess, right, because we don't need more problems, because we love celebrations, right, and we love getting together. Nobody's against that. We just don't want it to be to excess, and if y'all want to wear green, hey, but that just shows how people change things, don't they? That's kind of what we've been talking about, how people are trying to change the gospel and everything to whatever they want it to be. And they want to change things so they can be a party instead of worship and service to God and honoring God. They'd rather, you know, some people drink green beer, yellow beer, brown beer. I don't know. Just want to have a party. But Jesus didn't even drink beer, but it's neither here nor there. So if you missed any of these lessons, because I don't want to be a party pooper. I just don't want to be a sin promoter. Uh, you can go to our Facebook pages, which are Minister Detina or Detina Hampton Heard, or Pastor Detina Meditating Life Center, or you can look at our, you can join our foundational Bible study group. Those are all on Facebook, right? So please like them, because a lot of you all are following, but please like them. We're trying to get our numbers up like everybody else on Facebook so that we can have access to more stuff on there to more people, right? So like, not just follow, but I appreciate you following. Got hundreds and hundreds of followers. Got hundreds of people who have liked it, but we would like for you to like the pages. If you like what we are doing, if you like what you have learned, if you like, you know, uh, following Jesus and being able to have these lessons right at your fingertip whenever time, the fingertips whenever you have time to listen to them, watch them, share them, right? Share them. Then please like our pages, Pastor Detina, Minister Detina, and Foundational Bible Study Group. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is Minister Detina. Don't get mad at me if I talked about St. Patrick's Day or something. Uh, today we're going to have a continuation of Scissors That Don't Cut. We're on part three, which is probably, probably the end, but because of time last time, we stopped, and then the Lord gave us something else for this week. The name of the sermon is Scissors That Don't Cut, Part 3. It's going to be called Blunt. You party people probably know what a blunt is, right? But it's not called a blunt. It's called blunt, like scissors that are not very sharp, right? So we're still in 2 Thessalonians. We were in Chapter 1 last week. And you can go back and watch it. And we're going to be in chapter 2 today, even though I might go back. You know how I like to review in case you missed it or to make the connection in the lesson. So as you get your Bibles, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 2. I'll lead us in a word of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for this day that you have made. 
Lord, we are still rejoicing. We are still glad about it, Lord. Even if we partied too much yesterday or last night or even today, God, uh, we just want to redirect that party into honoring you, Lord, and making our confessions, Lord, and our repentance and our gratitude and our joy of being able to be with friends and family, being able to be with you, being able to do what's right when we used to automatically do what was wrong. Now we know how to have a good time. We don't even need a party to feel good, but a party feels good because we're with like-minded people who love you and love each other. So God bless it. And Lord, just be with those, Lord, who are suffering, are going through something, Lord, in, in their bed of affliction, whether it's in the mind or the heart, whether it's in the physical body, or even in our spiritual being, Lord, just be with us. You promised you would never leave us, nor forsake us, Lord. So today is the day of salvation for those who do not know you in the pardoning of their sins and have not received the gift of the Holy Spirit who always directs us towards you so that we never lose our joy or our hope or our peace. Lord, we always come back to center, which means we always stand with Jesus. We abide in you. Lord, please allow these push Christians, Lord, urge Christians by your spirit to come together in unity of the body of Christ, Lord, with right minds and right hearts to comfort and encourage each other. Lord, we thank you for the ones who provide comfort. We thank you for the ones who provide encouragement. We thank you for the ones who teach. We thank you for the ones who preach. We thank you for the ones who evangelize. We thank you, Lord, for everyone you have sent. We thank you for those in the body who are diligently seeking you, Lord, and sharing what we learn with one another, drawing each other close as the day grows closer. So, Lord, we just thank you for everything you've done. The glory goes to you. There's none like you. We lift up your name. We give you honor and glory because you are good to us and we know it. Lord, there's some that wish they could see this day, but they didn't live to see it. Lord, there are some who may be struggling, but they, their hope is in you. So they know at some point they're going to be okay. Lord, there are some who slipped yesterday, Lord, but it was just a slip, Lord. You won't let them fall. You won't leave them there. Righteous person may fall seven times, but they'll always get back up, Lord, if they are in you. So today, we pray for the lost, Lord, that they come to you. Today, we pray for the saved, that they stay with you, Lord. And today, we lift your name on high, praying that everything we do honors you and everyone receives you today in whatever area of their lives that they need you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, our mission and vision statements, our scripture is Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, which a lot of you may be familiar with by now. It's, it reads, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity... We should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Our mission statement is we're meditating on God's word, we're communing with God, and we're abiding in Jesus. Vision statement number one, it should never be Christians hurting another Christian, right? Forgiveness and repentance are available. God wants unity of the body. Number two, regardless of religion, affiliation, or denomination, if we consider ourselves, quote, good, moral, or righteous, as this family of God, we must avoid and or repent of wrongdoing, sin, and or crime. And number three, we share what we learn. We don't just criticize ignorance, wrongdoing, or foolish behavior. We come alongside and model good, right, wise, godly, and righteous thinking, behavior, obedience, and decision making. Because I'm forgive people who's watching you and you say, I'm a Christian, I go to church, and all those things, you know, which a lot of people will say that, but it's how we live. How we carry it out? Are we living the Bible? Are we living that profession like Jesus, right? And then also about Christians never hurting Christians. That doesn't mean you don't correct people. That doesn't mean you don't have rights and laws and things, you know, of the land. That doesn't mean that just because people don't like 
if you tell them something's wrong or you know you have to take an action a legal action it just means like you don't do, commit sins against one another because people will know we belong to him by the love we show for one another so how are you plotting on other christians you know we talk about self-examination brother tom you want to pray yeah thank you pastor most gracious and loving heavenly father we thank you lord once again for this opportunity to gather together to rightly divide your word iron sharpening iron we pray lord that this lesson will Go forth and be a blessing to all those who hear it and take it to heart. In Jesus' blessed and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So today's um, song is a hymn. It's a traditional hymn. It's called Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. And I don't know about you all, but some of these songs, of course, I was a PK, pastor's kid, lived in church. That's, you know, came naturally to me, learned the Lord from my, got close to the Lord, accepted the Lord for myself. You know, but it all started then and it has to start somewhere. <clears throat> you know, I like to say that because people say, oh, I wasn't raised in the church, so of course you know this and that. Well, let it start with you, right? And then you bring your family forward in Christ Jesus, teach them these hymns as well as all the up-to-date songs. And guess what? They're remixing the hymns, okay? So please teach them the way it traditionally went because I feel like that's a little more soulful and, you know, is into your soul, you know, where you can, oh, pass me not, you know, please do not pass me by. And then I always say, teach these to your children. And at least then when the hip hop or whatever they want to call it, hip hop gospel woman comes on, they go, oh, I know that song. And it's easier for them to know the words, all right? You learn it and then teach it to your children if you don't know it. And if you do know it, please teach it to your children, grandchildren, and everyone else. Pass me not, oh, gentle say. Save me by thy grace. Save me by thy grace. 
church or you want to make a donation then contact me uh, to this ministry um, it's meditating life center in Louisville, kentucky and of course we're still looking for a building we, uh, we know god's going to direct and guide on the day because he's put us, he's brought us this far and everything in our lives we've ever done he already made a way that we walked right into it y'all so hopefully this is the time so you all can come and be with us and we can all just really expand this whole thing and just make an explosive worship experience where the spirit is high and the, the peace and the unity and the joy just feeds us for the entire week. That's the you know intention as well as going out and doing community service. That's why we think maybe God will have us join with another ministry who would be the community service arm of that ministry, although we would also preach and teach. So you are keeping us in mind if you're looking for some you know an arm of your ministry, you would want Meditating Life Center to join with you to see if that's what God would want, right? Other than that, we're hoping God will give us our own location. And that's where a lot of the, your giving will go, probably. Of course, it costs money to do, you know, to have a service. You have to have paper, ink, buildings, lights. So please give where you're fed to your own ministry that you attend, your local church that you're a member of. Uh, bless your own pastor, your own leaders. You know, you want to bless them, the ones who do the work for you on your behalf or for your souls. And things like that. That's not like the whole thing. Like people like to say, you're only here for the money. And that's not true. You know, they, you pay the people that's in concert. You pay the people who come and act on stage or in movies. You, you know, you, you bless them really. I mean, because you don't have to go, right? You just go like, I, what you're offering to me is a blessing to me. I want to. I understand there's a cost to it, right? When you go to a movie, or when you go to a play, or when you go to a concert. So why is it when uh, people are pro providing a service, helping us in ministry, helping lead us to God, helping to encourage us, um, help us to understand the word so that we can go through life in a much easier way, and let's have understanding and unity of the body. Why well, when you say, well, you need to give, then people go, but not to you. Jesus didn't get anything, but that's not true because we know, again, look at Luke 8, the eight. The women funded Jesus, okay? So it was like he was a person. He had to have clothes, food, shelter, all these different things. It just costs to do ministry. But for real, the Bible was really just wanting to show your heart to say, like, no, we want to support something that helps our lives be better. Okay, so I'm going to get off of that. And I always like to say, get to your local. Definitely start with the ministry that you're a part of. Okay, keep your lights on. <laughs> Bless your pastor, you know, and whatever all you all are doing that, that honors God. Um and then reach out further out into your local community. That's what I say. But be led by the Spirit. I mean, he, God may tell you to do something to a global ministry. But I like to say the global ministries seem to be doing well because they're even sending stuff to us, right? They're sending us money and coins and envelopes and all kinds of little stationary things that cost money to print. 
And the money that it costs to print those things are the accumulation of the amount of those coins would probably fund a smaller ministry, if that makes sense. So they must be doing pretty well. So if you see people out in your local ministry doing things, feeding the poor, feeding the hungry, or providing a service, tutoring children, or things like that, be led by the Holy Spirit. Another church that you see where you see people are coming in and, and being blessed, you see people coming from that ministry and being a blessing. There's many opportunities to give. Someone comes up on to you on the streets. On it, on it, on. Give, and it shall be given to you. Full measure, shaking together. God promises a blessing because it shows our hearts when we give of our finances and give of our time as well as uh, uh, praising him and worshiping him. So you contact me if you want to give to the ministry because there's a special way uh, to, to do that. And if you want to be a blessing to me, you can just cash out me. You can put the app on your phone um, and the cash app on your phone and then my uh, I don't want to call it my, the way you write, you send it to me is a dollar sign and then my name, capital D-A-T-I-N-A, capital H-E-R-D, or you can sell me uh, with just my name or something like that. Some people send it by mail, contact me, you know, thank you for people who really have honored me that way, who really, I feel like you show support for this ministry, all right? Um, you, you can be God-giving. No matter how you try, or just as sure as you are living, and the Lord is in heaven on high, the more you give, the more he gives to you, so keep on giving. Because it's really true that you can't be God giving no matter how you try. Brother Tom, you want to pray over the offering? Yes, Pastor, thank you. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this offering, Lord. Bless those that could give, bless those that could not give. Let this offering be a service to those that in the community in which we serve. In Jesus' blessed and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now it's time for our sermon, which is called... Wait, do you remember this? Blunt. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's <laughs> called Sisters That Don't Cut. No, of course, of course. Part three, three, part three blunt. Yeah, okay. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, just let this message go forward the way you intended it. Lord, help us to do your will. Help us to examine ourselves, but not to doubt, not to fear, but to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we've been talking about scissors that don't cut. I mean, for you all that missed it when I was talking about why I felt like I was led to teach this message, it was because one morning I got up and I walked over to, um, I think I was cutting out the thing that goes on the front, the pictures that go on the front of the bulletins. And the scissors wouldn't even cut, y'all. They wouldn't even go through the paper. I was like, dang, what the heck? This is useless. And it seemed like it came in my spirit and it said, and that's how some people are. You know, they might not be, today we're going to talk about you might not be useless, but you just might be dull, you know? Sometimes it's just useless because you're just making it all up and you're it's not you. I'm not If I'm not talking to you, I'm not talking about you. Thank God you're saved, Holy Ghost filled, sanctified. And Jesus, hallelujah. You know, I'm not even saying it to be facetious because there's some Christians out here. Some people try to act as though just because we still are not perfect that we still are, are not in Christ or something or there's something wrong to be, you know, but hey, some people, they are doing their best. They are giving their all, you know, and no, that doesn't mean that you're perfect, but you know in whom you believe and that's a good thing. You know, so we're just still learning and growing. But there are some people, they are frauds. I mean, the Bible already said there's going to be fake people. There's going to be people who profess Christ. There's going to be false teachers. So we kind of got into that last week. 
And today we're going to talk a little bit, you know, I think, to see where the Spirit leads us about people who, they may be in Christ, but they are they have grown dull. They are blunt, okay? And so we were in 2 Thessalonians, and we went through uh, 1 Thessalonians, and we were looking at how Paul, were, Paul was greeting people and telling them how glad he was that they had grown in Christ, how they had grown in unity, and uh and things like that last week. Well, this week, <clears throat> we're going more into the, the part where we're talking about um, Jesus' return and signs of Jesus' return. Uh, actually, in this version that I have, this translation that I have, the Good News translation, it's called the Wicked One. <laughs> okay, and so I, I had some definitions. I had definitions of blunt and stuff like that. What did I do with that? And I got all this stuff up here. Here it is. So this defined blunt. And I know some of y'all already hollering some, like y'all smoking. But it's like, you know, like, I know blunt is, you know, but yeah, but that's not what we're talking about today. We're not talking about that kind of a blunt. We're talking about having an edge or a point that is not sharp. And I really liked that definition. You know why? Because when they said an edge, like, don't you understand, like, sometimes you got to have an edge. You know, there's something about you that stands out when you speak or you're, if you're an actor or a performer or you know someone who professes to have truth or have something that people might want you got to have a little edginess to you something that stands out and then this has a point and definitely when you're talking to people or you're singing to people or you're even an actor on the stage everybody's are you watching a movie okay especially here lately when i'm complaining about the writing one of the number one things we find ourselves saying is what what is your point Okay, mm -hmm. so it's funny that you can use it different ways. When it says, if you're blunt, then your edge or point is not sharp, like laser. Like, we get what you're trying to say. Okay, so you can be blunt. It says you can be abrupt in speech or manner, or you can be direct and straight to the point. Um, my mom would say, you are too blunt. Okay, so sometimes you have to watch when you're that kind of blunt because you don't want to be insensitive, right? That's another thing it talks about. It's like some people are obtuse, right? They don't understand that you're too blunt. Like you just say it. But that when I did it, it was because I did not understand I had the gift of discernment. So understand that sometimes you know things that other people don't know yet, okay? And so when you say, I know you know that, and people get upset because they don't. And then I had people come back to me and say, how did you know that? And that's how I realized that I knew things before other people did. And so now I either tone it down. Sometimes don't water it down. If it needs to be said, then say it. And then consider and maybe pray about how to say it and definitely when to say it. Because Jesus was very blunt sometimes. He's like, woe to you. You know, you priests and you, you know, keepers of the law, woe to you. Whoa, you know, he might say that you're like a whitewashed tomb. You're pretty on the outside. I'm paraphrasing. And you're grimy on the inside. You know, so sometimes he was blunt, especially if you like cornered him and he let you know. That's what I like to say. He let you know. And um, so sometimes it's a time to be blunt. People don't get it. So sometimes you got to go like, well, let me just say it this way. Okay. Now that you bring that up. Okay. And then like Jesus, those are all Jesus words right there. And you just say it straight out sometimes. But a lot of times you have to, you know, you be careful in the way that you say it. You might not want to be that blunt because it's sharp, right? If you, want, you um, But this, this bluntness we're talking about is where you're having an edge or a point that is not sharp, like scissors that don't cut. You know what? What is worse sometimes? You know what it says? The word of God is like a two-edged sword and it cuts, you know, going back and forth, you know, through the bone and the marrow, you know, getting to the truth of the matter. And, you know, what's what's worse sometimes, y'all, when y'all got scissors or a knife or something? And is it worse when it's dull or is it worse when it doesn't work at all? Because I know when you get when you get a pair of scissors, at least me, and it doesn't work at all, you, go, you quickly go like, this is not going to work. And you go find another pair of scissors or get another knife out of the drawer. But when you have the one that's kind of gnawing on the paper... Doesn't it even destroy the paper sometimes? It was just pointless almost. It's like, you might even get done, you know, get what you're trying to do done. You'll get it cut out, but it'll be a hot mess. So we don't want to be that kind of blunt. We want to be sharp when we present the word of God, when we when people are looking at our lives. Of course, you know, the other definition of blunt is the marijuana cigarette. And we're not talking about that because we don't want too many marijuana cigarettes where we are not sharp. Okay. 
So, you don't want to be the kind of blunt where we're not sharp when we're presenting the word, when people are looking at their lives and looking at our lives and they're confused as to what and whom we're really believing. And so that's what Paul was so glad about these people in, Thess in Thessalonica that no matter what somebody brought to them, my brother Tom was reading a commentary in his Bible earlier where it said like people were trying to mislead them. Um, one of the things was they were trying to tell them that Jesus was going to return any minute. And remember one of the signs of the end times is that people are going to be saying they're, G they're Jesus or they're God or God sent them or a sign and they give you a date which no one can give you and all these things. But Paul was glad, you know, to hear that no matter what happened, they still kept their faith even though they were a newly founded church. Now, how many of us have been in Christ for quite some time and every time some new thing comes out, we're going, we want, you know, maybe we don't even think about it. I don't want to be too accusatory, but sometimes I'm a little blunt. Not a little blunt, but a little blunt in saying things straightforward and direct. And it's like, you know, but sometimes, you know, we go like, hey, Everybody else is wearing a short dress or everybody else is dancing in their ministries and everybody else is, you know, doing all the popular dances. I've seen a lot of videos where churches just broke out into almost like the club and stuff. And uh, let the Holy Spirit be your guide. But I don't think Jesus and them were up there dancing that way in the temple or in the synagogue. I really feel like that if Jesus is our model, then we need to do it the way that he did and be of course, Paul made some adaptations in the way that he did things based upon what he felt like would be an ideal uh, circumstance or situation in, you know, the, in the places where he was teaching at a certain time, at certain times, so that the message would go across more uh, efficiently, right? So you may have to make some adaptations and some changes. God may have you setting up ministry in a different way, but it doesn't, I don't believe it would go so far out that whatever we're doing takes away from the word. That whatever we're doing takes away from our accountability, our responsibility to learn what God would have us to do, who God is wanting us to become. So we don't want those distractions because those distractions can lead to deception. And whether that's on purpose or not, we need to be mindful of it, that especially as leaders, as parents, you know, teachers, whatever, be careful be sharp in what it is you're trying to present and trying to teach people or get people to know, learn, do, or apply so that when other outside forces come in against what you're teaching or what I'm teaching and we want people to know, it can't be watered down or changed because the message was what? It was sharp, it was direct, it was to the point, even though it may not have been super blunt in that way, it was sharp. Does that make sense to you all? Okay, people know exactly what it is that you're wanting, expecting. What does God expect from us? He expects holiness, okay? So we're not twerking in church and we're not bopping so much in, in, in ministry. We're, if it distracts, from the main reason we're there, which is not for attention for ourselves and not to just make everybody feel comfortable all the time because it's no different than the world or the, the club, but to teach people what God requires, what Jesus said and did, so that one day we'll go live with him, even if it makes people uncomfortable and even if it drives some people away who are just not ready to make that change. Do y'all understand me? Okay, so he gave them praise and we're all happy. I love heaven, I believe, celebrates when someone is truly saved and the times when we say no and we pass our Job experience that maybe we may go like, oh Lord, what are you doing? Or we weep and we grieve and we wonder, you know, or like John the Baptist in jail experience. Is, are you the one? Look at how things are working. We always come back centered because we remember you heal the sick and you let the, make the blind person see their ignorance. Lord, we remember when we were so ignorant and we really thought we knew it. And some of the things were so self-destructive and we thought we were smart when we were stupid. Okay, and the Bible does say stupid. And we're still learning in some ways where we hurt the most and hold it against God. It's because of our ignorance about God. And as we see things unfolding, just like your word says, Lord, then we go like, dang, I never would have thought I'd see the day. 
when enemies might be members of my own family and they go and get in collusion with people who don't like me, but that's I. Because I have God on my side. I'm going to stay on this path and trust that this path is going to lead me to everything that I need if I just hold my peace. I don't get my gun. You know, of course, there's self-defense, but I don't, and it's not in your mind because you're offended, right? It's like someone's trying to take your life, not your perception of it hurts your life because they hurt your feelings. But you go like, hey, I'm going to be like Jesus. I'm going to stay on the path of doing the will of the one who sent me. I'm going to stay on the path that I'm going to be happy. I'm going to stay on the path that I'm going to have peace, even though my heart is broken over what you've done. Even though my feelings are hurt in the way you're doing things, I see you. I see you. But guess what? We talked about last week where God said, hey, vengeance is mine. I'm going to repay them for what they've done. And we talked about how sometimes we pity people when they get their consequences. So don't start afterwards talking about how stupid you were to do it and put on more self-hatred because you can't, you're not even allowed to hate yourself. That used to be my issue. I hated myself. Okay. I, I felt like, you know, that nobody really respected me or treated me of value as I grew up. You know, I didn't understand my value and, people, and children get that from their parents. And you don't go so far to the other direction that you make them narcissistic because you worship your kids. Oh, look at the little earring and the ponytail or the long hair or the curly hair and all the girls want a two-year-old and, you know, look at the little girl with the little short dresses and the weave and all these things, you know. Know why you're doing things like when I started off with the St. Patrick's Day thing, you know, not to pan y'all from having fun, but to Say, do you not understand that he didn't even, green does not honor St. Patrick, okay? It honors an Irish festival, and hey, have at it as long as you don't overindulge. That's me saying that. But be careful because you sh every human being has the intellect, and definitely a Christian has the mind of Christ. So we should always know why we are doing what we are doing, and whatever we're doing, it should not bring dishonor to God, even if you're, you know, you're having a good time or whether you're in church. Or reading the Bible, right, in both ways. Somebody look at you and they go like, hey, that's God's person. They are having such a good time, you know. They might have all these other things going on, all these different circumstances. People lying to them, trying to mislead them. They're, they haven't been feeling so well. Their family member may not be feeling so well. They may have had a loss. They may have not gotten what they hoped for, but they still have joy. And so joy and fun is a good thing. Brother Tom, do you want to read some of chapter 2 for me? Sorry. And, and, Starting in verse 1 in okay. 2 Thessalonians. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye not soon be shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes, <laughs> exalted, ex, yeah, exalted himself above all that is called God. I want you to stop it when you finish forward. Okay. Or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Wow. And so in our Good News Version, it says, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to be with him. Remember, he would believe in the rapture. Some people don't believe in the rapture. And I say, hey, either it's going to happen or it's not. Be ready for the day when we know Jesus is coming back. We know that for a, a church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. So be ready, okay, for him to come back. Live your life every day as though he's going to come back. Remember, we, I like to say how mom and daddy go somewhere and everybody get buckled out sometimes, you know, especially if that's in your nature, okay? Some of us was good at tissues, you know, but every now and then, you know, somebody entice us on something or something would entice us. But some people, they, every time, mom and daddy's not here, you know. They almost have mom and daddy time. They know how long it takes mom and daddy to go to the store or, what they said they were going and they act a fool, you know, out of character, out of what they've been taught in hopes that they can get it all done before mom and daddy come back. But it's always some kind of evidence of mom and daddy knows what happened or somebody tells it, right? You know, some people say little birds go back and tell God what happened, but we know we have the Holy Spirit. So it's like, don't be so easily confused, don't, you know, 
that you don't realize that he is coming back. And it says, concerning the coming and being gathered together with him, I beg you, my friends, not to be so easily confused in your thinking and upset by the claim that the day of the Lord has come. Uh, he said, perhaps it is thought that we said this while prophesying or preaching or that we wrote it in a letter. So sometimes we have to go back. Sometimes I go, for you all who got it the first time, we go, we have to we go back over territory that we've already taught. And you go, like, but you said that because for the ones in the back, like y'all say, even though some people said it's an insult, for some people who didn't quite understand. How many people have been taught something they didn't quite understand it as much as they do now? I'm a witness to that myself. So they said human beings have to hear things multiple times before they truly understand it. And then you have context. What was going on that made you understand it a certain way? And what is going on this time that makes you see it a different way? Right? That same concept. So he said, I hope we didn't mislead you accidentally. He said, don't let anybody fool you because it's not coming until rebellion takes place. Remember, Tom was reading that to us, that wickedness was going to prosper. It was going to proliferate. Remember, and then the wicked one is going to come who is destined to hell. He's going to oppose every so-called God or object of worship and will put himself above them all. And he will even go in. I put these words separate. He'll go in, sit down, and claim to be God. And how many of y'all worshiping people right now? Certain pastors and leaders and, and, and leaders in, in the, the world out here and whatever. Someone you just really admire, particularly because other people admire them. And some people are worthy of honor. They do the right thing or they've done things to help people or whatever like that. But no one is God except God. So you have to be careful. Because a lot of people are opposed to everything, right? And you have so much support in that. Like everybody's Holy Ghost Junior, as another a leader likes to say, that you look online and people, you know, they know just enough Bible to be dangerous. And other people, because that's what you need to believe in order to stay in your sins or to feel comfortable, you go with that. But whenever you see someone quoting scripture or supposedly quoting scripture, please go read the whole thing to get the principle in that scripture. Because the bottom line is go and sin no more on everything. Stop your sinning on everything. Honor God in everything. It doesn't matter if Jesus didn't kill people because of their sins. It doesn't matter that just because God allowed something, that it doesn't necessarily mean he agreed with it. Like when people talk about people having multiple wives, if you go back, there was Adam and Eve, not Adam and a whole bunch of other people, or Eve and a whole bunch of other people. And he even told Solomon, don't be bringing, getting all these wives and stuff. It's just going to bring trouble. And that's exactly what happened. It's always been Jesus out of the mouth of Jesus. It should have been one man and one woman. So please, please, please read the Bible for yourself. Start with your King James. Have your other translations. Have your commentary. Talk to someone that's a teacher or a preacher or something. Do it together in a study. All right, because the time is short. It really is. And people are leaving here every single day unexpectedly to us. Without, you know, there's a time for everyone, you know, and then the judgment. But please make sure you're not deceived with these partial Bible phrases and, and these people dragging out what they need to believe about God and about Jesus. I was listening to somebody, I was reading something that I um, had in here. I think it was talking about how people just water down Jesus. They're not sharp. They're like scissors that don't cut. Like Jesus wouldn't cut. You know, he has a sword coming out of his mouth in Revelation, that two-edged sword, because he's the living word of God, and the word cuts like a two-edged sword. The truth is going to be told. The truth is going to come out, right? And so we look at that, you know, that he humbled himself. Do you understand? Like we're coming into really the more of an understanding about a humbling that Jesus did. You know, it's almost like if someone in a high position came in. I was talking about Brother Tom because he was a sergeant. And I said, you know, when you're amongst the people, you might come in and say, here, I brought cookies. And, let's, you know, let's, we're going to sit down and we're just going to have some cookies and tea and we're just going to talk for a few minutes. And just imagine if that's all anyone ever said about their sergeant, their leader who's going to lead them into battle, that's going to teach them what they need to know to survive, to be good people, to be strong leaders themselves one day. And they go like, guess what? We like... Sergeant Tom, because all he he gave us cookies and tea, you know, and he retired and they said cookies and tea, but they never remembered how to use their guns. They never remembered how to be in formation. They never remembered how to dig a trench. They never remembered anything else. You know, obviously I'm not a military person, 
But it's like, you know, these things. That's the same way some people do with the Bible. They're only picking out the oh, well, Jesus said he, he didn't throw a stone. Or Jesus, you know, he wouldn't help people and, and this and the other. But Jesus is still God incarnate. Okay, holiness did not go away just because he blessed people. He came the first time. He diminished, I hate to use the word diminished, but he reduced himself as to come as a man. He couldn't come in his full glory. We would all die. We can't live in the presence of God. We can't stand. I, I'm wondering if that's why we went, you know, why when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, they couldn't even come up there. They had to look at it from a distance when he's in his glorified body. You notice it was always pretty much in a distance. You know, even when he's walking on the water, it's kind of a distance away from him, you know? And when he came in to visit him, he said, don't touch me yet. Okay, things like that. So the glorified Jesus is the one who has the authority to turn over tables and say, whoa. Okay, but when he came the first time, he didn't come to judge. He came to save. Okay, so yeah, sometimes when you read and you read those portions, you go, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for this dispensation of grace. But you can't remember the holiness of God when you go back to the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, okay, the scriptures, and go like, wait a minute, God used to kill people. He would get rid of his creation when it came against him. But he loved us so much that he gave, he's giving us what we need in order to be able to come to him because of the kind of vessels that we're in. So we give God glory. We praise his holy name for grace and mercy because he came full force. Woo, we all probably be wiped out, but he sent his son in the form of a man so he could walk in our footsteps so that he could see. I feel like God could see what it's like to be a human through Jesus. And then we could see what God was like through Jesus. That's why he's our mediator. He's standing between God and man to make what? Peace. Does that make sense, y'all? Okay. So by the time I was reading that about when he comes back, there's a lot of things that have to happen before he actually comes back. The world is getting more and more wicked. So we're just waiting for the arrival of the evil one. He's just being restrained and he's, he's going to be let loose. By the time you want to keep going, go to uh, 12 for me. Okay. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doeth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believeth not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. All right. So, the, so it's saying that, don't you remember I told you all this while I was with you? Yeah, it's, keep, it's keeping the wicked one from being able to do whatever he wants. You know, there's people having the millennialism and all these different things. To me, be ready any minute for whichever way this thing goes down, saying it bluntly, when Jesus returns. That's the thing we know. That peace is the truth. He will return. Most people believe there's going to be a rapture of the church first. He's going to come and get us and take us with him so that we don't suffer from when he lets the wicked one have his way. But the wicked one is already on earth. We see sin. We see death. We see all these things happening, this mis, you know, leading, for, especially for people who want to be misled, right, who want to keep their sins, who are fearful or, you know, haven't given their lives to Christ so they have that protection and that peace and that confidence that you have when you know that you are being held by someone stronger than you, like God. And so it says all those things have to happen. And when Jesus comes, though, he's going to kill that wicked one with the breath of that sword, that truth, with that two-edged sword, the living words coming, and he's going to kill Satan and put him back in hell where he belonged. But it's going to also be with his angels, those demons, and all those who went to the wrong side. You know, like scissors that don't cut, it just got sit to the side. 
You know, that you speak words, but you don't mean them, so they don't have power coming from you. Thank God, again, that the word itself has power. There's many who won't be saved, but the words that come out of your mouth that you profess that you don't even believe, and I'm not talking to you. If I'm not talking to you, I'm not talking to you. But if I am talking to you, today is the day of salvation. Okay, they're just saying words because it impresses other people. Okay, but then they go and plot on God every single day. They get together with other people to plot on God and commit on purposeful sins, okay, not mistakes, not errors, not habits that you pray to be broken. But right now, if you could, you do it right here in front of me, standing here. You go like, look, God, I'm going to sin against you. That's how much you hate God because there's one side or the other to God. Either you love him or you hate him. There's no middle ground. And even if our love is kind of like filthy rags, he still accepts that love because he knows that those that are in Christ, he's bringing us along to more and more to a greater love walk to be more and more like him. And so he's pleased because he's looking at Christ in us do, doing that work. And so is every, they're going to use all kind of DC. They're going to be merciless. Sometimes it just frustrates me and I have to pray because I know I'm not God and I'm not the, definitely I'll ha I have power because of the Holy Spirit, but it's a work of the Holy Spirit to change a heart. And sometimes people do such foolish stuff. I mean, like look at your children for an example, but they're children. Okay, there's so many adult children that think they're smart, but they're dumb. I always say that. It's one of my sayings. You think you're smart, but you're dumb. You're being deceived and you're a fool, a biblical fool. Okay, not me calling you a fool, but what the Bible defines as a fool, which is a person who refuses to learn. Some people don't learn, Lord. Help us to learn. It's like when you when things don't work out for you, it's not to try them a different way if they're wrong things. Let them go. Okay, I did it wrong the first time. That's why I went to jail. I did it wrong the first time. That's why I went to prison. I need to find someone who will accept me sinning against them. Don't y'all understand that we can't accept you sinning because God doesn't accept you sinning. We can't change what God calls a sin, even if we stay with you, even if we're still your friend. Okay, God's going to judge that sin. Okay, we can't okay sin for one another. We can have mercy on each other. We can work with each other, but we're supposed to call it out, okay, to help build each other up. Again, sometimes we have to be that kind of blunt, okay? But we should never be the wash down, not having any point blunt, okay? Just go like, I don't know. I can't tell them what to do. They already know this and the other. And surely you don't nag people to death. And sometimes you just go like, you know, why should I tell someone what they already know? But you may have to separate. You have to do some things that make some person where it sticks, where they can really hear it. You know, the tenant doesn't come around as much anymore, but she was, you know, Complaining or always talking about how every time she looked up, I was lying, okay, or I was doing, you know, these things like that. And uh, maybe I need to consider that I lie a lot. I, I need to stop lying so much. Sometimes if you separate yourself a little bit, not, you know, necessarily give up on people, but kind of put up some boundaries uh, on, and take a stand, put up God's standard, it causes a change in people. It causes a change in ourselves, right? So he said, you remember that the wicked one's going to come, but Jesus is going to kill him. But he's going to do all kind of false miracles and wonders. And everybody's you know, going to be like, wow, that, you know, they, he might have a mega church. I'm not saying all mega churches are evil. I've gone to big churches where the spirit definitely was high there. Uh, the leaders were sincere in what they were doing for the Lord. Uh, but, it's like, you know, the people will follow them for the wrong reasons, though. And they're the person that's even at the head of it will put other people around them that are in the same kind of sin so that they don't have to be held accountable. I've seen many ministries like that, too, that they're all in purposeful sin. So they all are in agreement in what they're doing, and they judge the congregation who tries to be holy, which is ridiculous. Okay, so be careful of those kind of things. If you're in a church that is okay with you sinning, saying you're still forgiven for something that you're not even sorry for, that you don't even, they don't require repentance like the Bible does, like God does. You don't require growth. You know, you just get mad when you don't do whatever they're expecting. But instead of bringing people along with mercy and kindness, to teach them and have an expectation, gives me an accountability that we will do what God requires. You gotta understand the same way Jesus did it. Okay, so the disease is gonna come, it's gonna be merciless. They'll use your body, they'll use your money, they'll use your home, they'll, they'll use anything. The, the evil one will use people, the evil one will mess with our heads and our circumstances. And it's merciless. That's going to be the hardest thing for us to accept sometimes is why someone would purposefully do evil against you in these last days that you've been good to. But even David said that. He said, you know, if it was someone out here, if it was my enemies doing it, man, I could probably accept that. But it was you. We sat together in the temple. 
No, I did all kinds of things for you and with you, and it's you that that stabbed me in the back. But remember, Judas sat right there with Jesus every time, showed up for dinner, you know, whatever. And then he just went on out and betrayed him. And then at the end, what happened? He found out that people didn't even care nothing about him. They're like, get on out of here. Take your money and go on, boy. Okay, so you got to be careful who you're fooling with. You got to get to know people. You got to get to know yourself and your weaknesses and your issues and deal with them. You must be born again. You can't be the same old person that's always purposefully doing wrong. And we can't be the same old person that always hates ourselves. We got to be that one that we look at what God thinks of us, and that's the person that He wants us to become. And then we won't be so easily deceived because God is with us, God is in us, God is for us. And so God, because at the end, he's going to let people believe whatever they want to. How many people say, you just do what you want to? Yeah, just do what you want to. I told you everything. You know, sometimes it breaks your heart if it's your child. You know, like, oh, my God, this child is headed in the wrong direction. You know, and you watch your child go to prison, but it probably saved their life because of who they were hanging with. All the people they were hanging with may be dead right now or drug overdose or whatever. So even though prison is a horrible thing, of, you know, till, till they get it right as to, you know, getting these prisons cleaned up the way they should be and, and run the way it, it was intended, you know, as an incarceration to, for the safety of someone and themselves to be made into a better person if that's possible, not to be abused even more and they're sent back out here worse, right? But sometimes, you know, prison, was, even as bad as it is, it saves a person's life. And some people are made better by having gone there because they take advantage of opportunities in a place where they had to sit still for a minute. They weren't able to run all over the place and make all kind of problems. And some people have died, okay? But God's gonna let people believe whatever they want to at some point. He, he, you know, when he says he sin is a powerful delusion, most people believe it's like he just moves his hand and just lets you do whatever you want to. Because that's what you're gonna do anyway. So keep believing false stuff. Keep believing people saying, saying words to you that they don't have to back up. Oh, I really like you. I had, again, I have, Aspen had a friend that told him to his face, you know, when when I come to your house, because there were a lot of perks and benefits to coming to my house. Aspen, my grandson, some of y'all remember Brother Aspen. Um, and he would say, you know, so you get cookies at, at my house, you get food at my house, you get games to play at my house, you get attention at my house. So it's great to come to my house. But Aspen was not popular, because Aspen had some little issues. And so this boy would come there because it's a great place to come to and to visit. And he told Aspen, he said, so when I'm over here, we're friends. I'm your friend. But when we're at school, out in the public, we're not friends. And that's how some of y'all try to be with God, but God's not playing. Okay, he said, either you're with me, you're either for me or against me. That's what Jesus said. So you either have to be for him or against him. Okay, so he's just going to let you have your way, and you're going to giggle just like a little imp or a little demon. And other people, you know, sometimes when people are doing evil with you, they even think you're stupid. How many people have discovered later that the people they did stuff with didn't even care about them? When you went to jail, did they put any money on your books? Okay, did they come and visit you? Did they even take one phone call from you? And they, they didn't care about you. So we have to deal with our issues as to why we're attracted to sin, as to why we're attracted to people who don't mean any good for us, how we're so easily deceived. Because we don't want to be lost, right? And definitely people, believers are not lost. They can never be lost because another one they will not follow. So again, today is the day of salvation if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. By the time you finish for us, please. 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God and for you. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope, through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen, amen. amen. So he, started, he ended with a blessing. So he starts out and he's like being grateful for them, uh, giving, you know, accolades to them for standing firm in their faith. And when we were talking about 
um, first, in the first chapter, and then he goes on and he talks about, don't let people fool you about Jesus coming. He hasn't come back yet, but when he does, he's going to, uh, the wicked one has to be released here to do whatever he's doing, because it's a testing of our faith, right? And uh, who, what we're really believing, but if you go to the other side, then he's got, at some point, God's going to allow you to just stay over there. So please examine yourself and see if you're really in the faith. And if you're not, give your life to Jesus Christ today. He's knocking on the door of your heart saying, come to me. You don't have to people please. You don't have to believe a lie or a deception. Honest to goodness, you can make it through this life standing firm, even with your heart broken. I, I came to heal the brokenhearted. I came to set the captives free. You don't have to be deluded because of what mama did or didn't do or daddy did or didn't do or your molester or your or the criminals or the people who harmed you did or didn't do or by your disappointments or your frustrations or your hurts or your fears. I promise you he'll take those away. You don't want to be amongst the conde condemned, <clears throat> be easily swayed by every wind of doctrine that looks popular while you twerk in the church. And all people remember, they don't remember that Jesus saves, they remember that the pastor twerks. Okay, they, they don't they don't remember. Do not pass me by. I'm crying, Savior. Do not pass me by. But they remember like the the popping song that just said all these little poppy words instead of crying out to the Lord. Okay, in the hymns and the selections that your ministry is teaching to people, it's not God centered. It's concert centered, it's popularity centered, okay? We don't want to be in that crowd of people. You want to be saved. You want the truth. You can handle the truth, I promise you, God. It's been so many shocking things, and yet I was able to absorb them. And I'm so glad about it because now I can teach it to other people. I can prepare my family, okay, for what's to come. Please, don't you want to be that superhero? At the bottom of it all, most people just want to be that superhero. At the bottom of it all, people just want to be honored and respected. Then be in Christ. Do it God's way. Stand firm, steadfast, and immovable. Always abiding in the faith with your full armor on. You know, especially that helmet of faith where nothing can man mess with you. Okay, I'm not going to say the cuss word. Okay, you can't mess with your head. Okay, can't tell you different stuff. Back in my day, again, he would just say, my head does not screw off and on. Okay, so people can fill it full of garbage and tell me things, that even in my spirit, even if I can't say exactly why I know something's wrong with what you're saying. I know you're not telling me the truth, and I can handle the truth, even if it means I have to lose you as my friend. Do y'all understand? Because Jesus is my friend. Okay, God is my friend, and I got to hold on to that truth, because I know it's going to make things go my way. If I don't give up, I will reap a harvest of blessing. I will be sharp. My sight will become sharp. The way I see things will become sharp. It will not be dull and useless, and it will not be blunt where you got to make all this extra effort to understand me or to for me to get through life. You understand? I don't want to be dull or blunt. I'm going to be sharp. God is going to sharpen me. Jesus is going to sharpen me. The Word is going to to sharpen me, and it's doing it every single day. I'm sure some of you all have seen even my growth in my delivery of that message, the confidence that I have in the delivery and the truth of what I'm delivering to you. That's God that has become honed and sharp, amen, with no fear in it anymore of what people will think or what people will do or who will like me or not like me. And yes, it does touch my heart that I have lost some friends or I can't be as close to some people as I would like or I just see you for what you are. I still like you, but I know I can't trust you. And that's unfortunate because it's almost like having to be on guard when you would like to relax. But the Bible says stay sober and vigilant because the devil is roaming around trying to see who, like a lion, looking for who they can devour, and he is heartless. And the people he uses are heartless until they come to Jesus and be saved. And so Paul, he starts with that those accolades, and he ends with a blessing. And he says, we thank God for you at all times. And I thank God for y'all at all times whom the, whom the Lord loves. I love the family of God, and I love even the sinners. And I pray you come to God because it's frustrating to watch people be stupid and think they're smart. Every one of us has been there. Every one of us still has areas in our lives where that may be said of us. But thank God for Jesus and his Holy Spirit who shines a light on that mess and helps us to mature in Christ and in truth. Amen. And then it says, uh, for God chose you to be saved by the Spirit's power and to make you his holy uh, people 
and by your faith. Because, you know, people have faith in all kinds of stuff. Faith means what you're believing in, okay? And that's making your actions follow what you're believing in. God don't see in the dark. I'm going to say that every week. People think if they do it in the dark for some reason, it doesn't count. So that means that your standard is people. Because it's only people that can't always see in the dark. God sees everything. If he is your God, then we understand that ultimately our sin is against him, the lawmaker. All right? And so it says, God called you to this through the good news we preach to you. And how would they hear without a preacher? How would they be saved unless they hear the word? Teach the word to your children. Okay? And then live it yourself. I mean, don't be hypocritical. Live it yourself. Some people don't want to teach their children because they want to stay in their sins. And then they know they're afraid their children will judge. Okay? But that's the Holy Spirit, I believe. And God plucking in your heartstrings to say, like, you got to change your life. If you don't want to be hypocritical, if you don't want to put your family's lives at risk because you need to teach these things that they need to know, don't be lying, don't be stealing, don't be committing adultery, don't get up in other people's mix, don't be trying to take other people's things that belong to them, not their animals, not their spouse, not their possessions. You, God's going to bless you with what's for you, honey. Just wait for it. God's got it all planned for you. But then they see you flipping out and crying and committing crimes and settling. Come on now, let's get it together, y'all. God is good. He's got everything in store for us. No good thing will he withhold from those who love him. I said, goodness, he won't. Okay, and anything that you don't get is because you don't need it. Or you just won't need it right now. And so he says, the good news we preach to you, he called you to possess your share of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know if we share in his suffering, or some things that we don't get or some things that don't go our way or sometimes we don't feel so good or sometimes we're even on our bed of affliction. Our hope is in Jesus Christ that everything that happens to us is part of the journey for which God created us and it's leading us to where he wants us to be. So we still give him glory and we still give him praise and we still say hallelujah. Even on our deathbed, we will praise the Lord because that just means we're going to be with him. Like Paul said, you know, to live is Christ, to, I mean, to, to whatever it is, but we want to be with Christ, right? So we, even if we live, he said, I want to be here a little while longer with you all, but hey, if I die, I get to be with Christ. All right. I don't want to misquote scripture. That's what I said. So it, he said to live, I think he said to live with Christ to die is gain. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it's like he said, so you get to share the glory. Because he had to suffer. People talked about Jesus. People did they threw rocks at him. So they wanted to stone him. He just got away because it wasn't time for him to die. It was people that said, You have to come under our authority, then we could diminish you and handle you. But he said, I didn't come to serve you. Sometimes we have to say no. Do you understand that? No can be like sharp when you say no to sin. You say no to things that are not for you. And you can say yes to God and you can see yourself shining. And when we're talking to each other and encouraging each other and doing the right thing or praying about it or being confident it's like that iron sharpening iron. You ever see people take those two swords and go shoot, 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 two knives, shoot, 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 so they both get sharper. You know, that's the iron sharpening iron. That's that two-edged sword speaking that word. It cuts through the BS, right, and helps us to come to the right conclusion so we're sharp and single-minded in our serving of the Lord. He's the one who gives us the diverse ways sometimes of carrying it out, right? But we have that confidence, don't you? It's going to be okay. He's going to show me what to do. So we give him glory and we encourage one another and we give each other honor and accolades on our successes in God. He says, so then stand firm and hold on to those truths. Stand firm in your face. Stand firm in your full armor, your, your breastplate and your belt and your helmet so everybody can't get to you in that sword, which is the word of God. Be sharp and not blunt and not like a scissors that don't cut. Right? That you say stuff and nobody believes you because they're looking at the way we fall apart at every little thing or the way that we don't live the things that we say. All right, but we're going to be sharp. And it says, uh, so then our friends stand firm and hold on to those truths which we taught you both in our preaching and in our letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and in his grace gave us unfailing courage. Courage. You know, people who got courage don't sneak around the dark and tell lies. Okay, it's a coward. And cowards will not see the kingdom. The Bible says that. Look it up. And a firm hope. And, and not see the kingdom means not only you won't see God, but it also means like no matter how much somebody tries to tell you the truth, it doesn't make sense to you because you're stuck. 
on trying to cover, <laughs> duck and cover, right? In the dark where your God doesn't see. Um, it says in front and where other people tell you your God doesn't see. Let's sneak into it. They're godless, godless. Come to Jesus and affirm hope, encourage you and strengthen you to always do and say what is good. All right. And so if you don't know Jesus Christ in the parting of your sin, today is the day of salvation. All this stuff is like, it, you know, this is a lot, you know, but it's not a lot because it begins to make sense because the Holy Spirit is our teacher. So all, he got 24 seven to work with us. And the thoughts come into our heads and then they get cast down because we know what the word says and the Holy Ghost reinforces those truths to us who's not blocking them out who's not who are not suppressing the truth because we want to stay in our sins or we're too afraid like the man who hid his talents to go out and make make things grow like when he talks about the mustard seed faith that it's a little bitty seed but when it turn when it grows it's one of the biggest plants ever so if your faith starts with mustard seed it's another scripture where people just stop there but it's expected to grow and grow and grow as you have experiences with God and I have experiences with God and we have experiences in life how life really works and when we learn that word and we look that life works just like the Bible says and it's just miraculously stunning and astonishing and it doesn't make sense as to why people do what they do but it matches up and we want to be on the right side so our vision is sharp and the words we use are sharp but they're tempered with grace mercy and love by the holy spirit and our love for one another unless the time comes to be blunt all right so we never want to be dull we are scissors that cut because the word of god is like a two-edged sword so if you i want to make that confession of faith today you say i know that jesus christ is my lord and savior i want to be a friend of god i'm tired of being out here being swayed by other people i'm tired of going to jail i'm tired of using drugs i'm tired of using alcohol i'm tired of being a whore and a whoremonger i'm tired of being promiscuous people using my body i'm tired of hating myself i'm just tired okay there's got to be a better way something in me the holy spirit god jesus knocking on my heart the truth of what i heard preached is telling me that I need to give my life to Jesus. I believe it, okay, that he died on the cross for every one of my sins and that he got up on the third day. When I read his word, it shows me all the people that saw him, okay? When I listen to other people give testimonies, I see him in full effect. And so I believe that he got up on the third day and that he is seated on the right hand of the Father. And I do know that he makes intercession for people because I've seen people do all kinds of stuff and not get the repercussions of it. There's something holding them and buffering them and being with them. And I believe that it is you, Jesus, by your Holy Spirit. So I give my life to you. I repent of my sins. I want to change my ways. Lord, have your way with me. Jesus, come into my heart, into my life, and be my Savior today. For real. For real, for real. I give my life to you. And I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Have your way with me. If you make that confession of faith and it's real for you today, welcome to the family, y'all. Welcome to the family. We accept you. We love you. It's got accountability and responsibility um, uh, based upon what God will require from us. But, man, it is a great life. It really is. You could stand here. You could have just been crying 10 minutes ago for what somebody else did. And you can't even believe how you're just still standing here preaching the word. Are you still taking your kids to the parade? Okay, even, so, even though somebody might have left you or somebody hurt your feelings or you don't even know how you're going to pay your bills next week and you say, we're going to the parade and we're going to have a good time. Come here, let me read you a book. I'm going to watch a TV show. I'm going to take a nap. All those things will be enough cause, while you wait on the Lord. I promise you. All right, so go find a ministry near you. Go get baptized. Tell them you made that confession of faith of Jesus as Lord of your life and ask them to baptize you. Try to find a ministry where you can ask questions. You can... Uh, talk to your leaders, um, or your leaders are supportive. They do the things that the Bible says. When they teach and preach, you can find those those principles in the Bible. It may not be word for word, but the principle of the thing. You know, you must be born again. You must forgive. You must learn how to love. All those things, they have you have to be able to find them in the Bible. And if you can't, you need to be able to go to that leader and ask questions. All right? And in the meantime, and in support of it, you can still follow us at Meditating Life Center. And I'm always open to questions. We have many discussions with people uh, through Messenger and right there in the comments. All right. And it's all kinds of people that are really in the body of Christ. Um, 
go to them with your questions, go into just walk into a building one Sunday and say, now I speak to your pastor or someone who can explain this Bible verse to me or discuss it with me or when is your Bible study. It's all available and pray. Even with your full armor on, pray without ceasing. All right, pray for one another, pray for yourself, that God reveal yourself to yourself so you love yourself. All right, and then join us next week at Meditating Life Center uh, for our next lesson, our next teaching, preaching, and hopefully you pray for us that God will, will watch over us and protect us and make sure that we're teaching the correct way and get some building so you all can come and be with us. Stay blessed.